My name is Dr. Lee Eisenberg. On behalf of the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, you are about to view a basic otolaryngology examination, which will consist of the ear, the oral cavity and neck, the face and nose, and the nasopharynx and larynx. Normal anatomy and normal variances will be discussed. Common abnormalities in each area will also be discussed. For additional information, Regarding any of the illnesses we discuss, we invite you to visit the AAO HNS website, entnet.org. Today we're going to do an examination of your ears, nose, and throat, mm -hmm. and head and neck area. And um, we'll start with your ears. The ear has three components the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The external ear is sometimes called the auricle or pinna. Looking inward, the external ear includes the concha and the ear canal up to the tympanic membrane. The middle ear starts at the tympanic membrane and ends on the bony floor of the middle ear. The inner ear contains the cochlea and the labyrinth. The concha has the following components, the helix, antihelix, tragus, antitragus, concha bowl, and lobule. And we're checking for any lesions, like um, little uh, skin cancers, um, hematomas, lap ear. Now we're looking behind the ear, checking the mastoid area. All looks good. Common abnormalities of the pinna or external ear include basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma, lop ear in which the anti-helical fold is missing and the conchal bowl is often enlarged, and auricular hematoma which if untreated leads to cauliflower ear. The ear canal has a lateral cartilaginous and medial bony component. The cartilaginous component has the same color skin as the individual. It contains the glands that manufacture cerumen. The bony canal skin is usually pink in color and thinner and therefore sensitive when examined. Common abnormalities include cerumen impaction, otitis externa, an osteoma, and exostoses. In using the otoscope to examine the ear, pull gently posteriorly on the helix, a maneuver that straightens the normally S-shaped canal and allows for better visibility. One should use the largest speculum that the ear canal can accept, as this increases visibility. Another way to hold the otoscope, which is especially helpful in children, is in a rather upside down position, which, re which gives added stability. It is important to remember that when inserting the speculum to stay on the cartilaginous canal, as already mentioned, the bony canal is quite sensitive. You need to remove any wax out of the way to better visualize the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane may be silver or gray in color and translucent or opaque. The most prominent anatomic feature of the tympanic membrane is the handle of the malleus, which sits in the tympanic membrane and is somewhat anterior in position at its distal end. Extending from the distal end of the malleus, also known as the umbo, is the light reflex. This will help orient you 
towards the anterior inferior aspect of the tympanic membrane. It is important to remember that the presence of a light reflex doesn't necessarily mean that there is a normal middle ear. The light reflex is important in evaluating pneumatic otoscopy for the mobility of the tympanic membrane. Now I'm going to assess the tympanic membrane mobility by puffing some air into your ear canal and checking the movement of the tympanic membrane as I do that. This needs to be done and documented on every pediatric patient and be accomplished on every adult whenever possible. In the pediatric patient, the tympanic membrane may appear to be normal but have no mobility suggesting the presence of an effusion in the middle ear. Surrounding the edge of the tympanic membrane, one often sees a white structure, which is the cartilaginous annulus. The tympanic membrane itself is made up of two components. The pars tensa, which makes up about 90% of the tympanic membrane, and the pars flaccida. The pars flaccida sits above a bony prominence, known as the short process of the malleus. The pars flaccida may be retracted and be the presenting site of a cholesteatoma. In acute otitis media, the tympanic membrane is erythematous and may be bulging. When the tympanic membrane is translucent, one may often view normal structures of the middle ear. Posteriorly and superiorly, part of the incus may be seen as well as the corda tympani crossing from posterior to anterior. Posteriorly and inferiorly, one can see the shadow of the round window. Anteriorly and inferiorly, the shadow of the opening of the eustachian tube may be seen. A common middle ear abnormality, especially in the pediatric age group, is an effusion which may vary in color such as yellow, gray, clear, or blue. At times, one might see air bubbles or an air fluid level. The tympanic membrane may have scarring, commonly known as tympanosclerosis, or it may have a perforation. Because the inner ear cannot be seen, a thorough history is extremely important, as well as any other additional information that will be gathered. This is true for both neurosensory hearing loss and vertigo. Tuning fork evaluation of the ear may be done, but is often of limited value. In the Weber test, the tuning fork is placed on the forehead, the bony nasal dorsum, or the front teeth. Ask the patient to tell you whether they hear the sound louder in one ear or the other, equal in both ears, or they cannot localize the sound. Classically, the tuning fork is louder in a better hearing ear in a neurosensory hearing loss, and in the worst ear if there is a conductive hearing loss on that side. The other test is known as the RINA, in which the tuning fork is placed onto the mastoid tip and then in front of the ear canal. Okay. Okay, do you hear that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Is this louder or softer? Louder. Okay. It is important that when putting the tuning fork in front of the ear canal, to put it either perpendicular or parallel. A normal response would be air conduction is greater than bone conduction. If the conductive hearing loss is large enough, then bone conduction will be equal to or greater than air conduction. A normal rena does not rule out the possibility of a sensory neural hearing loss. When the rena is normal, it is reported as positive. However, this is confusing in that most positives indicate abnormal tests. For additional information regarding any of the illnesses we discuss, we invite you to visit the AAO HNS website ENTNet.org.